Hello and welcome to CTV. This is the month of the woman and like we promised you from the beginning, we are holding conversations uh, that are helping us to um, to, to respect uh, the, the rights and, uh, of young women and girls in our communities, but that is in line with the theme for International Women's Day or Women's Month uh, about uh, ensuring a sustainable future through gender equality. And with me today, um, I have two experts who will be sharing their knowledge with us um, on uh, the rights, um, especially of casual workers, as they are known, and uh, the maids. But before we even think of um, those that uh, we're now exporting as a country to external countries, there's something that we need to address uh, here in Uganda. And that's why we do have our two experts here with us. Um, Agnes Igoe, the Deputy National Coordinator for Preventing of Trafficking in Persons. Um, and we also have uh, Badri Tamale, he's a legal officer for Platform, uh, Platform for Labor Action. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, you are very much involved, uh, especially when I start with you, Agnes. Uh, you've, you're very passionate. This is not just something that you're doing because of, your, of the office uh, that you're in, but you're passionate and you're doing uh, work to prevent trafficking of persons um, in, in your personal life. Um, and also for Badru, the, your organization has been doing a lot of research uh, on educating. I, I know you did a lot of, of work during the lockdown when so many people are being laid off mm -hmm. and you are giving information information and say if you're to be terminated this is the right way this is what companies should do this these are your rights and responsibilities as workers and uh, you'll be telling us more on that now uh, recently in recent years uh, maybe we'd say especially the, the last five years we've seen more and more stories in the media both mm -hmm. television print and websites on Ugandans who are suffering um, as they go abroad some of them losing their lives mm -hmm. others coming back when they are permanently lame um, etc and that goes in to the laws. We also see efforts that are being done uh, mm. by the government uh, to try and crack down on these labor export companies um, uh, uh, and so on. However, uh, when we are to understand, first, it starts with the rights that we have here as workers, mm. um, as Ugandans, before you go abroad. Mm. What are you supposed to know? Um, we'll start with you, Agnes, especially, mm. to tell us what is the difference uh, from your technical point of view of being taken out to work mm. um, as a worker, a dignified worker, mm. and being trafficked. Mm. When does a person know that, okay, I think from what's going on, mm. I think I'm being trafficked. Or from what's mm -hmm. going on, I'm going to do dignified work mm. and bring remittances back to Uganda. Yeah, F th thank you very much. That's a brilliant question. Uh, first of all, um, when you're talking about human trafficking, right. uh, Uganda enacted its law, 2009, the Prevention of Trafficking Persons Act. Uh, the importance of that act was like, you know, we have to define what this is. So they said, okay, when you're recruited, you know, when you recruit, you know, transport, harbor, receive, uh, you know, a person, you know, through different means. Uh, the most common one is fraud. Uh, with people who are going to work, it's they deceive you uh, that maybe there's a job opportunity. There's even abduction. Uh, there is even taking advantage of your vulnerability. There are people who have so much power and they do that. And they do all those things for the purposes of exploitation. Now, when you're talking about exploitation, there's a variety of, of ways because you know trafficking is both internally and externally. Actually, the biggest trafficking is internally in this country. So exploitation, you know, you're exploited in sexual exploitation. Uh, there is uh, forced labor. There's child marriage. Uh, there's the use of uh, a person to commit, you know, you know, crimes, especially like children, street begging, or they make you to carry drugs and, and all that. There's removal of organs, not just for transplant, but also, um, you, you know, for rituals, uh, for witchcraft. You know, we've seen that, you know, a lot, a lot in this country. So there's a variety, you know, of exploitative means. Uh, but the most common one which people always, you know, hear about is that you're, you're taken abroad and what, but there's a very big, you know, difference. So now how do you know that you're being um, trafficked? Yes. Maybe if I, if I get into that. If, for example, when you're going abroad, you've not followed the procedures, the, the, the procedures. First of all, do you have a passport, a document to travel abroad? If somebody is not taking you through immigration, that's already a red flag. That oh you're passing through a bush, you know the you know using um, using ungazetted border points, yeah. you know. If somebody tells you that you coaches you to lie, eh? that is common. They lie. The most common right now is that you know you have a visa, 
you know, to Dubai. Yeah. Then they tell you to lie that you're just going to visit because you have a visitor's visa. In your mind, you know you're going to work. Mm -hmm. So they tell you to lie, so you are also uh, telling along that, thinking that now, um, you, you know, you're defying, not knowing, <laughs> that not knowing that it is this person, you know, Any, anything about lying. You don't have a contract where you're going. It's somebody else. So that's why you find that, you know, the, the government, you know, they started licensing recruitment agencies. Uh, because if anything happens to you, at least we know. We know where to start from, where to go. We, there's somebody accountable. And right now, very, very important, if you don't go through pre-departure orientation, you're supposed to take two weeks at least, taking you through the laws, the contracts, so that you understand what you're going to do. If you don't go through that, in fact, some recruitment agencies, if they forge that, you know, they, they are also, um, you know, they, 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 they are penalties in there. So you must. If you know you're moving and leaving this country and you're going for labor externalization and somebody lies to you and you actually don't go through two weeks orientation, then it is a red flag. <coughs> According to our laws, what is this orientation supposed to look like? Uh, orientation, actually they have a curriculum. Yeah. Uh, curriculum was, uh, you know, developed with the various, you know, the, the experts, means of gender, including even migrant workers and all that to understand. Because that, that, that pre-departure will take you through the laws and regulations, uh, you know, of the country you are going to, to go to, go to yeah. what to do in case you have, have, have a challenge. Uh, prepare you, because even you, it's not even just people going for work. If you're going to a different country, you know, the weather, the customs, and you, you've seen that many of our girls are going maybe to the Middle East. Yeah. Those people are Muslim. So like you're going to, if you're not Muslim, you're going to work with a Muslim, maybe household. You have to know, you know, they, they, they are just like customs, just like how you invite somebody in your home. What are, what are the rules and regulations within your home? But most especially, your rights, you know, as, as a worker. You know that there are certain things you, 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 you have your, your rights, like right to food, because you've seen some people uh, who, who have uh, made some complaints that you know, the, even the feeding <laughs> is not well, that, that freedom you know, of being a human being. And so when you, when, you are, when you are empowered with that and knowing whom, how do you report when things happen to you, you know, so that good channel. Uh, you, you know, do they get challenges? Yes, you may get challenges, just like how you can have uh, uh, people in your company or people, there are, they are, they are challenges, but there are modalities of, on how to do what, solve them. Then don't go in secret, that's another thing, you know. When, when people are trafficked, usually sometimes, you know, you go in secret, even your parent doesn't know, even your relatives, such that even when you're calling for help, they say, okay, where are you? You have no idea, you know, where are you? So those are just like red flags, this excitement. Uh, in Uganda right now, there's also excitement about boarding an aeroplane, no matter what. Somebody just tells you you're boarding an aeroplane. Aeroplane is the biggest recruiter right now. Social media is a big recruiter. It's your friends, it's your relatives. Those are the biggest recruiters right now because it's people you know, and then you just go blindly and think that, ah, you know, I'm defying, you know, government rules and all that. You think that's a longer process. That why should you take me for pre-departure? I want to go now. So those are things to prepare you, you know, to, for to work. Yes. You mentioned something about most of the cases happening mm. internally, yes. uh, which I think uh, maybe we do not put a lot of um, attention mm. to. Mm. The cases that are happening internally, mm. what, uh, where, the, where are they most prevalent? And, uh, and, and what are you doing about uh, that? Actually, it is, uh, right now it's among children. And started from, uh, you know, the trends, even through lo lo lockdown. I went to a sub-county, for example, in, in, in uh, Soroti. It's called Kamuda. Over 1,000 children were pregnant, talking below 18. Those are the ones registered at uh, health centers. Right. So it is problematic. Uh, in, uh, you know, last, last year, over, you know, 400, 421 incidents of trafficking, over 200 were children. It's sexual exploitation of children, and it is, uh, uh, it's harmful child labor. So we're sexually exploiting the children. They are fathers, uh, some of them. They are pastors, and they are also teachers. You remember there's a pastor, Didas, and now yeah. he's serving um, all his, uh, the rest of his life in, in prison. Because he was sexually exploiting boys, because sometimes we may, we may th think that only sexual exploitation is only girls, girls mm. but also boys. But the challenge is that boys will not get pregnant. 
because some of some of the uh, when the girls get pregnant, that's when you get to know you know some of them. But it's also important to know that happens to them. So there are variety. There is uh, um, exploitation in in in, uh, in 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 agriculture, for example. You know, in in the shambas, there is exploitation. Domestic workers, what you call house girls, yeah. the way we treat them, it is worse in this country than even the other people treat. Because when I tell people that if you told everybody, even in Kampala here, for your domestic worker, for your house girl to line up, and we ask her, you'll get shocked. These people are being sexually exploited in their homes. These people do not even eat the same meals that we eat. Those are double standards. You don't feed them, some mm. of them. So they and, have and challenges. That, that's where yes. we will we'll bring mm. in um, Council Tamale to speak to us. What are the rights of casual workers? Because I think, like mm. she has rightly said, if you ask most people who are employing um, helps at their homes, mm. we, if you think of maybe um, annual leave, for mm. a housemaid, it might mm. be unheard of. Mm -hmm. If you think of maybe sick leave for some people are thinking, no, you, you must work from 5 a.m. to midnight and for seven days a week. Thank you very much. Now with the issue of the of casual workers, I think let us first begin by defining who is a casual worker. Right. So casual workers have different categories of people. Mm. So when you look at the employment regulations of of Uganda of 20 to 2011, they, they list casual workers as a special category of employment. And then, basically, casual workers are people who do work which is not, which doesn't require a lot of skill, which is low skilled work, and doesn't really require a lot of skill and qualifications. So, examples of casual workers, like we talked about, can be domestic workers, can be loaders in a factory, can be, can be loaders in a factory, like a coffee factory or can be machine operators who are working on, on my factory machines in a processing, processing plant of a factory. All those can be examples of work of casual workers. But what makes them casual workers is that most of them, they are paid for work, for piecemeal work. That if you've done this today, I pay you this. If you, if you come in today and work, I'm paying you <coughs> 6,000 shillings per day. I'm paying you 10,000 shillings per day. Those are what, those are what we call, can call casual workers. But then you find that when a person works with an, a company or works in someone's home for a period of a continuous period of four months, then they then they what? They then they cease to be. They cease to be casual workers, and then they become workers who enjoy the who are able to enjoy the rights of the other workers in the workplace. So now then let's look at the rights of workers. So through the rights of workers, the first right is that you're entitled to your wages or salary when you work. So when you, the employment contract is between you and an employer. So there's, there's always that agreement that the employer will provide you work, and when you work, they're supposed to do what? They're supposed to pay you. So even if you show up to the workplace and the employer has no work, that's not, that's not your fault, you as a worker. The agreement was, I show up to work, I report at eight, you give me work, you provide me with work. So if there's no work provided but I've showed up for the whole month, you still have to do it, you still have to pay me. So, and payment can range from how you have agreed. You can agree to pay someone on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, or on a monthly basis. So uh, that's the first right of workers that you're entitled to what? To payment. To payment or your wages. Right. The second right is that if the person is going to do what? Okay, the second right is now let's go to rest periods and leave. There's a, there are the rights there, like annual leave, like you talked about. Now annual leave is 20 working, 21 working, working days. days. Mm. So it's paid leave. But you t the rationale is that you take a break from work because you cannot work throughout the whole year without resting. That it, it will impact the productivity of your output that you do. So the annual leave is 21 working days. Working days in a year. But for these working days to accrue, if you look at this, there are 21 days and we have about 12 months. So for each month you work, you accrue one and a half days of leave. So if you work, then you can do it. You can take that leave. You can take that leave. But with annual leave, you have to request for the annual leave. So if you don't request for the annual leave, if you don't request for leave from your superiors in the company, maybe the HR, or if it's a home, or if it's a personal business, the sole proprietor or your employer, so if you don't request for the annual leave, 
then the law takes it that you have waived that right that you, ha that you have to leave, so you cannot do what claim it. So there are other instances where, by instead of going on annual leave, your employer can say, you know what, I don't have someone, I'll pay you what, I'll pay you, instead of you going for leave, I'll pay you money for your leave days. You can agree to that arrangement, and then instead of you going for leave, you work the whole year, but then your leave days are paid in what? Paid in cash. Yeah. Then there's another, in regards to rest days, that the law says that, our law says that you have to work mm. for six consecutive days, then the seventh day, you do what? You rest. You rest. Mm. You rest. But this one is not really respected by most people. So if a person is coming to work on that seventh day, the law also, give, the law also gives you a solution that you double his money that, that you've been paying. Because I know the day someone is paid on a monthly basis, fortnight basis, or a weekly basis. Mm. So you can find out what person, what that, that person's daily wage is. So when he's working that extra day, you double what? His, his money. Same thing goes for public holidays. Now public holidays are gazetted public holidays. Not these ones that we send social media, Mother's Day, Father's Day, those are not public holidays. Public holidays are gazetted in the what? In the Public Holidays Act. So on public holidays, people are not supposed to do what? To work. But if they work, you pay them twice their, their daily wage. Yeah. So the other right, mm. the other right that, that still stems from one's employment is, is the way you're going to do what? Dismiss someone. Dismiss, terminate, whatever. So you have to, the doctor is that you have to treat someone with dignity. So in that, and the law lays down the procedure for terminating someone. So let's first get one first thing straight that every employer has a right to terminate, dismiss an employee. That one is what? That's but it depends right. on how it's done. Yes, but yeah. then if you're going to terminate and dismiss, then you have to do what? You have to follow the Hello. procedure. Mm -hmm. So now, when someone is, is being let go from work, there are two ways that's done. There's what we call dismissal and termination. Now, termination, through no fault of your own. But you can find that business has, has gone to a halt with the company. Like we said during COVID. Like COVID. Yeah. And they're not bringing in business, so they can't afford to retain the workers. Remember, like, I, like I said before, that as long as the workers keep showing up to work and then provide work, they're still liable to do what? Pay them. Now you can find like, like in, let's use the example of the COVID, like your contracts have gone to hold, your, whatever you're doing, people have, let's say you're a factory guy, the suppliers have, have what? The people you're supplying have said, you know what? Let's pause the contract. Because of COVID lockdowns, we're unable to do what? Move the product. But remember, you still have workers who are producing these things. So what you can do in that such a situation is that if you're going to terminate, you give a person, a, you call a person to the office, whoever is in charge of the termination, this is mainly the human resource officer, you call people, you, you let the, you speak to each person in a language that they understand, one by one. So if a person speaks Luganda, they speak Luganda. If it speaks English, English. If it's Acholi, Acholi. Mm -hmm. So in language they understand, they let them, you know what? A, B, C, and D has happened, this is the reason they're going to do what? They're going to terminate you or lay you off. But then when you're doing that, you also have to give that person what, what we call notice notice period. So notice period depends on how long a person has worked. So a person has worked for between a period of one year and less than five years. The notice period is one, is one month. If a person has worked for more than five years and less than 10 years, the notice period is two months. If a person has worked for more than 10 years, the notice period is three months. Now when you're giving, you can choose to give notice or you can choose to do it to give what we call payment in lieu of notice. Because yeah. you feel like even the two or three months, it's not really possible for a person to keep coming around, but then you have the money. So you do what? You give them a reason why you have done, why you're terminating them, and you give them the notice, notice money, which is payment in lieu of notice, depending on, how, on the duration a person has worked. It can be one year, it can be one month, for a person has worked for three years. A person worked seven years, an example of seven years, that's two months. A person has worked for more than 10, ten years, that's three months when they're dismissing. Then there can be a situation where the worker has lost discipline at the workplace. Now that's why you, you go for what we call a dismissal. So you're supposed to call that person for a disciplinary hearing, you're supposed to summon him. Now when you're summoning him, you give him a notice for a disciplinary hearing. Now you give him the notice, like I said before, in the language he understands, 
and then they give him ample time to do what, to prepare a defense. Because the law doesn't, doesn't say the ample time, but when you look at the court decisions of the court, seven days is taken to be enough time for you to come and prepare a defense. And then you come to the disciplinary hearing. So you, you lay out your case. Then if that, then the DC makes a decision whether they can, whether they, the, the issue is squashed or whether they, they do what? They decide to dismiss or not. They decide to dismiss. Yeah. Then they, then they have to do what? Do the other thing of notice and all that. But if that, Gross misconduct is clear, and you come and you admit in the DC, then you can be summarily dismissed without give, being given a what? If, uh, okay. A hearing. If you have yeah, confessed to the hearing, yes. offense. Um, um, we don't have much time uh, with Agnes because she'll be leaving us. Uh, but before you leave, um, mm -hmm. I wonder if um, some of the rights and uh, during the preparation before, especially those who are leaving the country to go and work abroad, mm. if that's part of the preparation, the laws of the land uh, that, they pre that they have to give mm. uh, to the Ugandans before they leave. And from your point of view as immigration, what are some of the frustrating things that you wish people knew, mm. um, especially before they go, and with the cases that you're working on, why you, could, you wish to help, mm. but you find yourselves constrained because certain things were not done by, mm. the, by the victims involved? Yeah, the most frustrating thing is when people don't go f through pre-departure orientation. Right now, I'm dealing with, uh, with, with uh, a case because they, 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 you, know, you, you leave the country, you don't even know who took you. Somebody's just telling me that Hajat from Lunguja. <laughs> so how many Hajats are there in Lunguja? So if, if somebody else has taken you, because pre-departure, you can imagine what he's articulated. Yeah. Those are the things we'll tell you. You will not even be looking for people that where, where do you, because even your relatives would know, because there's no secret about going to work abroad. Yes, there's no secret. So, so the, the challenge is when you don't know your rights, you don't know your contract, you don't even know how to behave when you go there, because it is, these are two people. You're coming to somebody's home, so, so somebody also has, uh, you know, has how you're going to, to live in that home, according to the rules and regulations. You know, some people go uh, as domestic workers or maids, and yet they hate housework. You hate housework, but they are taking you, and it is it's it's not your thing. Maybe so that is it's a desperation for jobs. And, and yes, to earn because they but you know what? You about yes, 1 million mm. but you know what that does? Because automatically you don't you don't enjoy that work, you know, at all. You know, somebody who enjoys it, who has been trained, you know, to work in it, will will, will do a better job. You know, because some of, now there are mixed flaws. Not everybody who is taken abroad to work is trafficked. Some, some things are labor relations, just like you and me. You can, you can go to work and there are challenges you have in your work. It doesn't mean that you're being trafficked. So things have been mixed up. So, so um, the, the thing I really urge people, pre-departure orientation, which is compulsory, if you go through a recruitment what? agency so that if on, anything on, happens to you we even know where to start we know whom to question we know where you are because minister of gender labor and social development you know has data you know about you on uh, that yeah. pre-departure orientation that you're talking about and mm. you've brought in a, i think a very interesting point of people going to do the work that they are not even passionate yeah. about mm. um can we then have um something that compels or even mm. mentors uh, the workers before they go because mm. now if you are going to a foreign country mm. and you're not even doing the work that you love You're not mm. good at the work you're doing mm. and you're not delivering mm. maybe that's what uh, also uh, Takes part in uh, in the other unfortunate incidences that mm. we see um, happening to the people can mm. we have a deliberate policy on saying Know the person that you're taking coach mm. them enough uh, mm. before you just take them anyhow And then also I think what we all often see is that the people who are traveling to the Middle East are going mm. to do um, Casual work and to be house uh, to, to be housemaids mm. Don't we have other things because mm. some of them that are going are actually graduates and have qualified um, In what they're uh, doing, you know, the most interesting thing is that uh, it's not only domestic workers right. or maids who are moving the only thing is that the media and people talk about them. There are many people even who go to do domestic work in the Middle East and come back properly after they are what? They are the majority. Because if you're looking at uh, like about 500 people going out, you know, they finish their two years, come back, and then go back. They are the majority. The only thing is because we keep talking, it's like domestic work. And another thing, even the terminologies we use, when you say uh, house girl, and that, those are demeaning. You know, we think that people who do that casual work, then we think that they are, it's not dignified work. 
It is. It's, it comes through even how we treat our domestic workers at home. Now, when women are moving, by the way, it is how we treat them and how we value their work. The moment we stop valuing it, then, you, then that's already, you know, a red flag. It's because as if they are not human beings worth the work. Because I have heard some people also saying that why, do, why should they go to do work? Then I said, okay, what's wrong with women going to do domestic work? Just clean up the sector. Because men go abroad to wash toilets. We are not complaining. So what is more, what you, when you're, you're trying to demean, they have the right to go to work, but they also have a right to go in dignity and clean up the sector. That when they raise issues that this, we are being affected here and here, we work on them and keep clean, cleaning. That's why you find the, the, the Ministry of Gender, you know, the, the new regulations, 2021. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of, because even, even a company before taking people, even an advert, on, on TV and what that advert has to be looked at by the Ministry of Gender. How do you advertise? The things to include in. Then even the people who are doing pre-departure orientation, you know, it's not just anyone. It is people who are qualified, they are designated areas. That's why it is important. And you can't, uh, you can't allow to take somebody ab uh, abroad without producing that report that they went through the training. So if you don't go through a recruitment agency, that means you're not going to have that report. You're going to go in hiding. When you get a challenge, we'll start, it will take a longer process. Because when you say, I'm in Kampala, where is Kampala? Where are you at? Some people don't even know where their countries are the countries they are in. I was yeah. actually very surprised. One of the survivors of trafficking said they told her that she was going to Dubai. Then, then when they were landing, she so welcome to Baghdad. That was the first time she got to know that she was actually in Baghdad and not in Dubai. So you can imagine. You're so moving. in that case, if you've gone through all the right things, then you, yes. you, you raise an alarm immediately. Yeah, mm. because you'll know, you'll mm. be empowered with information. Every step, how to move, passport, and, and all that, because this is useful not only for people going for domestic work. Can you imagine, like, even you people who are going to travel, you, you read, you find out, you don't just move, you know, following people. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. And then on the work that you're doing, because uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of uh, financial challenges for most households. Yes. And that's uh, what brought in also an increase in the number of child labor, like you mm -hmm. mentioned. Yes. And of course, usually that's for marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. What are you doing right now? Uh, mm -hmm. Because we saw the cases rise. Mm. Uh, what are you doing right now, very briefly, uh, because we're mm. almost coming to a break, yeah. um, to elevate or to reduce um, mm. that vice or to even actually eliminate it um, yeah. in the country? No, counter-trafficking work, actually, uh, we, we follow what is called the four Ps, that you're preventing something from happening. What does prevention look like? Like, do you deal with the issues that are making people move? Because, first of all, moving is not the problem. But it's like it should be that you're moving, at your, you're, you're willing to go. It's not something pushing you. Hmm? So th that's why all programs on uh, poverty alleviation, parish model, uh, f taking care of our families is part of it. Because I will tell you also the majority of women who are moving are running away from domestic violence. The majority are single mothers. The men in their lives abandoned them. That's a fact. Majority, I have 30 uh, victims of trafficking who are my advisors. You bring them, if you're to meet them, they'll come with their children, with their what, because it, they have children. They'll tell you it, they are going because they want to take care of what? Children. Now, who are the men of, of their lives? The men in their lives have also been affected by COVID-19. They've been laid off. But some of them, it is easier, you know, because a woman is the one taking care of the children. But they also have their challenges and their struggles. We need to help them. The boy child. Because it's the thing is like, okay, like who is making them pregnant? Because I remember during COVID-19, I was really very hard on, on, on for us to really be focused. Because during that time, the narrative was, oh, they are pregnant because the schools were closed because of COVID. A school closure or COVID does not cause pregnancy. We know what causes pregnancy. So let's right. deal with what has caused pregnancy. Don't give people excuses that, oh, because you closed schools, so that's why I, I, I had sex you know, with this girl mm -hmm. you know, to make her pregnant. So let's take care of our families. Deal with domestic violence. Deal with issues of unemployment. I will even shock you that there are people who are employed, but they will choose to leave. 
you, you know, because of things they watch on TV, they think out there there's gold, they think that, you know, it is a better way of life and all that. They have a different narrative. Then there are people also who go abroad, they come back, they had a difficult life. Snow hit them so hard, but they come back brown. So people think they are brown because they look good, but snow hit you, that's why you're brown. You, 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 you come with, the, with the English. Now, we also think that English elevates you. One time I was speaking, I was speaking and somebody said, oh, you can you imagine there are people who are moving and they don't even speak English. Who told you that only people who speak English should move? You see how we, we are supposed to liberate ourselves, right. that moving is, is a right for people. So you, do, you deal with the prevention, that means awareness, you know, how you're going. Then there's the issue of protection, that if it has happened to you, how do we protect those people? when they return. That's why you find that at the Ministry of Internal Affairs under my office, we, we work with about 14 ministries, departments, and agencies, including NGOs, because you can't do this work alone. You can't solve it, not even as one country. You have to liaise even with your neighbors, where the Ugandans are passing, you know? Uh, if they're using porous borders, you liaise with, if they're flying out of Jomo Kenyatta, it is important. Then prosecution, you have to prosecute uh, now we are having what we call, you know, um, prosecutor-led investigations. Prosecutors working closely with the police. You can imagine last year we convicted 30 compared to 11 the previous, previous year. Because now people are appreciating more. They, there are more people reporting. That's why reporting is very, very important. You know, you report, then our investigators. So it is, it's kept in, improving in there because you have to hold people accountable to send that message. Then you have to partner, partnerships, you know. You can't do it alone. You need your NGOs. You need means of gender, labor, and social development. You need foreign affairs. You remember during lockdown, we returned over 200, you know, how, over 200 girls yeah. liaising with, with, with gender, International Organization for Migration. We keep returning our girls, uh, you know, especially who are even, even in in Nairobi and all that, taking them back to Karamoja. It is a, a group, you know, effort. Because while others are rehabilitating, others are taking others to court, <laughs> others are partnering, because there are so many needs, you know, in there. Okay. So it's a collective effort. Yeah. Well, thank you. And the conversation continues uh, when we go uh, right after this short break. You're watching CTV, Month of the Woman, special programming to help bridge uh, the gender divide in our communities. And that means on both sides, both men and women, women, uh, I mean, girls and boys. And the impact or the use of this is to create a sustainable uh, future. And that we do by talking about all aspects um, of, of, the, of, the, of our lives, uh, economic, social, political, etc like you've been saying. Um, we'll be right back. Don't blink. CTV is now on Star Time. You can now catch all your favorite programs, our daily comprehensive news bulletins, and so much more on Star Time's channel number 248. Stay tuned for a world of endless possibilities. CTV, don't blink. The big debate is back. Bigger. Bolder, reloaded. Whether it is securing your future, holding fast to the people power, or the promise of a one Uganda, one thing is certain, the big debate is on. So oh, why not you respect the memories of what has this? We have already addressed the issue of increment. How many people have ever been convicted? Okay. It's the way the politics plays in cabinet. So okay. now why are they asking for the <laughs> statement? <laughs> Follow mainstream conversations on current affairs and leading policy debates in Uganda. It is in our interest to handle arrested people very nicely. Right here on The Big Debate. Let me, let me find no, we have all I was quiet. I was, I, no, I was quiet. It's a hard hitting talk show on development issues in the political and social economic arena. Discussions that inform policy and trigger high level dialogue. Now showing on CTV. Don't blink.
Thank you for staying with us. You're watching CTV Month of the Woman and we're still holding conversations uh, with specialist experts who are doing the most in our communities to create a sustainable future through many ways. And their work also uh, impacts uh, a lot of women and girls and of course uh, with the men and boys as well. But like we've mentioned here in CTV, we've seen that the injustices that happen in our communities tend to disproportionately affect women and girls. And that's why we have made time to celebrate Women's Month the entire month and to have these conversations that we believe uh, will be impactful. And here we're talking about uh, the rights um, of casual workers and uh, maids in our communities starting here. Um, like we've had earlier, um, Agnes told us that most of the trafficking cases happen internally, even before they go external. And also the respect of rights of the casual workers, it has to start internally before you even think of sending uh, Ugandans abroad because that empowerment before you go as a Ugandan has to start inside before going outside. Um, and before we went for the break, you had talked about how, and the research that you did um, as a platform for labor action showed that we had more cases of child labor, especially during um, COVID-19. Mm. Um, and we've also seen another documentary that has gone to places like, uh, I think the Busoga region, where we are seeing kids being forced into plantations and their parents are also cooperating uh, with that. So for the children, um, what, what, what is your work? Oh, oh, what work are you doing uh, to empower these young children, like the 1,000 that you talked about um, in Soroti, to take them um, out of those places, take them back home? And I believe there are also challenges with rehabilitation, going back to school, because a child might say, I'm making money. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to go mm -hmm. back. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll begin with, uh, um, I'll, I'll give examples. Yeah. Uh, for example, in the Karamoja region, what we did, because there were a lot of children from Karamoja region, you know, trafficked as far as Nairobi, even Mogadishu, then in different cities. So what we did, we went to, um, to, to where they come from, okay? Speaking to all stakeholders and leaders. Then the transit districts. Then we brought everybody at Moroto Hotel, I remember, with their members of parliament. Uh, they made resolutions. One of them arrested the parents because the biggest traffickers were the parents. So the parents were not reporting. So the parents would send their children, then the children would keep remitting. Uh, so they were even using technology. The, the children would move, one with a, uh, a SIM card, another one with a, um, with, with, with a shell you know, phone, another one, another one with a charger. So you wouldn't know. Then they go into destination and assembled. So when they are se sexually exploited, when they are what in the streets, because the parents may not know that, they remit the money because you have to pay for that car which they sold to be able to, to come back. And so because parents, you find that children are missing, for example, and parents are not even looking for them. That is a red word. So there are many ways of, because, because each child has a story on how they've, they've, lived, they've left home. Like I said, there's also domestic violence. Children, we went even to Busia, the majority of children, you know, also running away from home, is that there's a lot of violence against these children. So which means that... Pe perpetrated as, by their parents. Yes, perpetrated by parents. Mm. So that means you what? Now, in different areas in Uganda, there are different ways of exploitation. We even went, you know, like Busia, there's Tira Mind, uh, you know, where they, they do rudimentary what? You know, they use children to yeah. do that. Yeah. You'll find in Busoga region and where there are plantations, it is the, the, the children who, who, who are doing that. So we, we constantly have to do, you know, four things. You're either preventing it from happening, like, you know, taking care of the, the families, supporting those families which are struggling. You're, you're, um, you're pr prosecuting people. Huh? We, uh, for example, one time we arrested a, a taxi. You, 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 children are moving in your taxi you're taking them. So when, when it is trafficking, by the way, it's not just a person who is recruiting. Everybody on the chain. If you're a taxi and you're just blindly carrying children, you have no clue <laughs> where, where they are going because it is clear. You don't say you see because you're, you're facilitating the transportation part. So whoever is recruiting, whoever is transporting, whoever is harboring, whoever is exploiting, the whole chain we sweep so it doesn't mean that, oh, for me, they just gave me a child to take. Who gave you and how? Why do you just blindly do it? So it is a combination of issues. Then now school, school has opened. So like, you know, there's also issues of taking children to school. Then there's also exploitation, uh, you, know, uh, you know, genital mutilation. 
<laughs> even even that, you know. Gentlemen, we had our girls who were who ran, you know, to, to, to Kenya. You know, 70 of them, they were housed in, in, in a school. So working with our counterparts. Because it is outlawed, but why is it still what? You know, you know, happening. So the perpetrators, you know, in there. And, 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 and really supporting the families. How do we educate? What do these children do? Because during lockdown, children started hawking. It is children taking care of adults. It is so shocking these days that it's so easy for children to take care of adults. You, you I, mentioned uh, children yeah. from Karamoja. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And we have, I mean, a persistent problem mm. of uh, children from Karamoja being mm. on our streets. Mm. And I do not know what is failing the efforts because I believe that's mm. 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 Yes. the mm. Yes. Why have the efforts to rehabilitate failed mm. or seemingly failed mm. you know it is it is a wave uh, it is a wave it also you have to also to look at the cultural and, and ways i went i went to i've gone to karamoja many times one time i sat with with even elders because elders have a lot of power then i started asking you know sent questions i'm like okay uh, what 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 do children do in the homes they started by the age of four by the way you start herding cows it's children, you know, who help their mothers, you know, maybe, you know, you know, you know, to till, to do domestic work and all that. They started narrating what children do. <laughs> no then I asked, what do women do? Women build houses. Women look for the food. Hmm? Women milk cows. Uh, women do domestic work. Then when I asked, okay, what do the men do? There was silence in the room. Even the men who were talking and contributing, they kept quiet. Then one courageous man stood up and said, oh, we offer security. Then all the women said, which security? So it tells you. And there's even a lot of alcoholism now among the, among the men. So the, you, it is so common you find a man chilling under the tree at about 10 or something. The woman knows you have to bring the local brew you know, in there. So we have to go back to the basics. That how do you support you know, the family relations? So if you're an, an uneducated woman, by the way, in Karamoja fetches less cows, an educated woman, because that one is not going to do the milking, the what. So even, even the parents are discouraging their girls from going to school. So you can see, because if you are not educated, it is 30 to 40 cows. So that is, they're looking at you as a woman, as somebody who's going to bring much more wealth. So you have to do a lot of education. You have to put systems in place. Some of the leaders in Karamoja were actually saying that what they have to be, they should make uh, what compulsory. They're even thinking that all children should be taken to boarding school. So those are policy issues and discussions which have to be going on, you know, for, for, for that region. And also rehabilitation is important. You don't just return. It's like prepare them for that return. Because when we bring, you bring them, for example, we brought them uh, to Koblin Center, that's why you have to re rehabilitate them. Some of them can't even go to back to their homes. And you have to find them uh, ways on which to start a living. Because some return with the children who are not even seen as their own children in those communities. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking of crime, but this is, cuts across. So which, there are some, some areas, it is fishing, fishing communities, I went to Chotera, there's what is called marriage on lease, that they bring you, you, you perform all what of a woman, for two weeks, after two weeks you move on, they bring somebody else. Now what is that? Because if it has even terminology, that means that it is widely accepted in the area. Marriage. Yes. The local language? Marriage, in the, in marriage in, on the lease, they actually say it even mm -hmm. in English, marriage on lease, that you come for, for two weeks like that. Then we also saw a situation whereby parents uh, even, even, even the women, you know, you send your girl child that go and bring sugar and you don't give them money. What are you telling them? What are you telling them? Just go and sell your body and bring money. So those hardships, you know, we have to go back to family. How are we bringing up our children? That are we too busy? <laughs> even, even here in Kampala, there are some people who think they are too busy. Their work is only that, oh, I give them money. No, parenting. <laughs> Is a full-time job, very important. I want to bring in uh, Councillor Tamale in this. We're talking about the orientation, uh, especially even for those who are going abroad. But mm. uh, you mentioned, I will keep referring to what you mentioned, that we have trafficking happening a lot mm. in here. And we've talked about some of the reasons why that is happening, um, mm. including uh, poverty and marginalization, etc. Um, is there a way, or do our, can our local laws, national laws, um, in a way empower um, Ugandan nationals uh, who are abroad 
is there any way in which our national laws on labor so that um, if maybe something is happening to a Ugandan who is working somewhere, then maybe we can bring in the Ugandan law to help them, as we might see other countries. Yes. Uh, our laws, the laws are there in place. But one thing, before I go to the laws, one thing we should know is that when a person goes abroad, like she explained, when a person goes abroad, before they go, if you're going through the proper channels, they're going to have to go through orientation. Now, when, when they're being oriented, oriented for two weeks, they're going to teach about the culture and the laws of that side. So you have to know that most of the laws we have here in Uganda, they, they came from the British, from the British colonialists. So you can find that if a person who's going to work in the UK do not need a lot of orientation on the laws because the laws are similar to the ones we have here in Uganda. But if you're going to the Middle East, it's a different system of governance. Uganda is a republic. Most of the countries in the Middle East are absolute monarchs. So it's a different system of what? Of governance. So you find that the laws vary a lot. And what and, and this is what they call a, the standard employment contract. It governs the relationship between the migrant worker and their employer. Now that standard, standard employment contract comes from the agreements or the, the agreements, the MOUs that, that are signed between the country sending the migrant worker and the country receiving, which is normally Uganda, maybe Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Qatar, and then the, then the United Arab, Arab Emirates. So you find that that standard contract is that it, it takes out the jurisdiction of the Ugandan courts to do what? To handle such matters. But then now we have the regulations for external recruitment that govern external recruitment of workers. External recruitment is what people normally call export of labor, which is the wrong word to use because it means they're viewing people as cargo. So that's what we call external recruitment. Yeah. So now when the laws govern external recruitment is that if a person, in the laws govern external recruitment, there's what they call a company taking people to work abroad must have a bank guarantee of 100 million shillings. Now that bank guarantee, the rationale for it is that it will help in case there are what? There are issues that say person wants to come back, they have suffered accidents at, at work, or all that disputes between the employer. So that's, that, that's the money that they, what? they used to help to do it, to resolve those disputes. And then here in Uganda, that if you, your person has gone abroad and, and you have an issue with what has happened to them, this is where you go to report. You go to the Ministry of Gender and you raise your issue with the external employment unit or the Ministry of Gender, which is found in the basement of the in the basement, the Ministry of Gender. So the Ministry of Gender is located above CPS, that building above CPS, which was called Simba Manual House, but it's now called Gender and Labor House on George Street. So that's where you go and do it and you report your issue. And then, like my colleague said here, that if you have gone through a comp if if you have gone through a company and you have let your family members know that uh, there's, there's, a, there's a job advert here placed in, the, placed in the newspapers. I've seen it. It's the calling for security guards for men, for domestic workers in Qatar. So I'm going to Qatar and I'm going through this company. Let's use like Modern Science International Limited, but it's just a generic name. That's not just taken me. So you let your people know that this company has taken me. So now when your people, when you get issued that side and you're calling, your people here are able to go to the, that external employment into the Ministry of Gender and raise a complaint and then do what and say, so, uh, so and so, next thing divided, so and so went to this place, Qatar, she went to work as a, as a domestic worker, she was taken by this company. Then now that external employment will do it, will summon the director of that company and then they ask on the ground, what is the issue with so and so who went? Because you may find that, like she's my colleague say, the dispute could be about and between normal employer and employee, this prevents the case of trafficking. So they're able to sit down and tell the person can but can be held. Because but but then again those contracts that they signed, the standard contracts that you sign which govern the relationship between you and your employer. There are provisions whereby in case a person wants wants to come back, A B C A B C and D is done. In case so who's responsible for coming back, in case you want to end the contract early. So it's all there, not in that contract. That's why like you say it. If a person starts to go out, do not go out when you don't have a contract. And the contract, the contract is normally in two languages, Arabic and English. So if you don't understand English, you are advised to go and do what? 
and get someone in your family. And, and if this person understand only English, understands Luganda, they don't know Arabic, they don't know English. That's, that's what I've said, you should not know any of those languages. Mm. I advise to go and find someone in your community who understands English, so that they're able to do what? Interpret for you what? The provisions in of, the contract. Of the law. And that means that has to be done before the person goes, so that you know what's in your contract exactly. before you go. Because yeah. you cannot go and then you cannot go and then you make it make it up as long as you go along. But at least you have to know before you even go undergo all that. You have to know that this is what is in my contract. Because even the contract will show what's what's the most important bit of the what of where you're going. Right. It shows you how much money you'll be earning. Because the person can tell you they're going to be paying you. Let's let's say they're going to be paying like a thousand deal hands, which is the money for that side in the UAE. When you contract it, when you but then when you get there, they're paying for everyone you get. So at least when you have the contract, the people who took you they can raise a complaint. Then they contact what, what we call their appointed recruitment agency or their principal that side and say, look here, we took a person to this, we took a person to you, to you. So it should be adding this way, sharing this amount of money. If, if, for example, you mentioned something about payment, we've had cases where uh, maybe she took me, and then they are paying me 500 dirham, for example, mm -hmm. and then the person is saying, you have to give me 300. Um, no, you'll give me 200 of that cut for maybe say one month because I'm the one who took you. And then in some cases, um, this person says, oh no, I've changed my mind. It won't just be three months. It will have to extend maybe for two more years. In that case, does that person come to your office to, because now their rights are being violated and their money is being taken away by the person who took them? You know, when you go through a recruitment agency, that will not come up. That's why we insist, eh? go through. Because if a recruitment agency has done it, that, that means uh, the law will come at them. Uh, that, that's why, it, actually, the, like, last year, of, like 12 uh, companies uh, were suspended. So some of the, the reasons is like, you know, when you forge a training report, when you, when you charge people money outside the system, because every, for every money you're charging somebody, by the way, the Ministry of Labor has to approve. What are you charging it for? So very important. And just to add to him that every district has a labor officer. Because he's talking about go to Minister of Gender, it's here in Kampala. Now, those who are not in Kampala, go to the labor officer of your district. They will have an updated list of recruitment agencies because some, some join in the what? Some are, some are deregistered. I keep announcing, you know, some of, some of them. So that you keep in sync, you know, on what is going on. And if there are problems, go to the nearest police station. If you do, do we not have, come, mm, yes. Do we have the figures of the number of uh, recruitment agencies that we have right now? They are over 200, yeah. you know, over, over 200, because they keep, I, I can't give the, you know, you know the, the exact. So you can imagine, there's so much, you know, you know to, 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 to tap into than going through somebody. Because sometimes, because the promises are too good to be true, or you think that the, uh, you know, the, the system, the, that you can't sit for two weeks, because when the people who are doing pre-departure, they license these uh, this training institutions. It's not just anyone. It's like training you and preparing you to travel, you know, to go and work. I don't even know why you would not take such an opportunity. We've seen yes. uh, some of the uh, labor recruitment agencies, mm. um, even some which have come out in police reports, or have been implicated mm. for violating the rights of the workers that they take. Mm. And yet, uh, we continue to see um, adverts of some mm. of those uh, running in media, which I think now misinforms those who, who, want, to, who um, want to travel. I'll tell you, when they suspend a company, that suspension, the reasons are, vi are various. Because like when you are forging uh, a COVID-19 test, when you are what? So, so it's things go to court. But some companies, for example, they find out that it's maybe the director or your worker who has done it. Because now, like I think you, you've seen, there are some directors or what. Uh, and even they see, you know. So not all reasons tantamount to removing you off the scene. It's like a punishment. <laughs> there are so many times they've punished companies. There's some even government taken to court for dismissing people, what, and they pay penalties and all that. You don't erase the whole thing. But there are also companies which have never, which have been taken off and, and they can't come back because of the issues, you know, that they are in. So the penalties. So, so, so that's why I'm saying an updated list. Yes, you'll know that this, this company, for example, they say you forged it. You know, you, you forge this. Uh, so as investigations go on, you, you stop you stop taking them. So when they investigate, then they realize, okay, who was who did this? Then they penalize. Then they will they will keep updating that list, which is which which we said it is important so that you know. So each labor officer from every district will have that updated list, 
And then, because the most important thing is that you don't go in secret. And, and even then, when you're talking about recruitment agents, it doesn't mean that all the recruitment agencies will be angels. It's, it's like uh, being employed with the government. Government will make some mistakes somewhere. Somebody makes mistakes, but we know the procedures, what to do if something happens to you. So that even your parents, your relatives here, at, sleep well at peace, you know, at, at peace. Then, uh, then when we know that, we'll, we'll know, because many, some, some of the issues, not even the companies, it can be, even be you in the individual. You've been sent to work. By the way, we don't even talk much about that. People forget. Sometimes the employees defy, <laughs> and they don't follow, you, you, know, you know, the rules there. We've had instances where that, you know, when you're sent to a certain home to work, then there are people who lie to you, because when you're in a home, for example, you, eight, you earn like $800, out there, they'll tell you, oh, we'll give you at 1,500. Then you run away from where you've been taken, thinking that you're going to earn 1,500. You forget that now you have to take care of your accommodation. You, then you realize when you reach there, then you realize, oh my goodness, the other deal is even much better. So being armed with information, following the rules that if you're taken, what does your visa say? Your visa says that this is the, the, the employer because they have also the kafala system and all that. You know, we've, we've raised issues on, on that and as you keep improving. So if they've taken you there and maybe your employer is exploiting you, what is the procedure, you know, to go? Not to abscond from work. <laughs> yes. Now we've seen scenarios, even here, you've seen people have been given employment, the rules say this, and then they have scorned. They dismiss them. The only difference now is that because they are abroad, so they mix things. When you're dismissed or when you've done something wrong, then you conclude that you're being trafficked. No. So we have to really iron out these issues because what we want is to clean up this sector so that people move willingly, you know, when their rights are being protected, in, in, good, in a good way, so that you return. And also, we are also increasingly seeing cases, people who go to work, they finish their contract and come back. Now, instead of going through the right channels, they think that now they know Dubai, they know those exactly. countries properly, they go on their own. <laughs> or even, it can even be to the same employer. But now this employer knows that, ah, now there's nothing, no contract, there are no obligations. So there, you're, you, you're vulnerable to trafficking. Now you can't say again, you, you've seen people reporting, oh, this company, no, the company sent you long ago, you're supposed to come back, now you went on your own. Now the other company which took you a lo long time ago, is not held accountable. So we have to really be focused. Because sometimes we even, because of media, now social media, everything that comes to social media, people, people jump into conclusion and make conclusions. No, some of the things are not true. Some, yes, are whistleblowers. Then you get into the what? Into the basics to really understand that, okay, what happened? We've had scenarios where people have sent those video, viral videos. Then they say, huh, madam, I just, me, I just wanted to come back. I was just stuck, <laughs> but I wasn't trafficked, you know? So, so they are mixed. You know, there are those labor relations. It. Then it, they are different from trafficking. Trafficking is when you're recruited, transported, and all that for purposes of exploitation. You know, all those ingredients have to be there. Not every bad thing that happens to somebody when they are working is trafficking. Right. Yeah. Uh, this conversation continues. Uh, we hope uh, you're also taking notes on, because at the end of the day, we want to create awareness and we mm. want the rights of the Ugandans, both working in Uganda and those working abroad, to be respected. Because when you succeed as an individual, the country and your family also succeeds with you. Mm. CTV Month of Woman takes a very short break. We'll be right back. The big debate is back. Bigger, 
Boulder Reloaded. Whether it is securing your future, holding fast to the people power, or the promise of a one Uganda, one thing is certain, the big debate is on. So no, why please. don't you respect the memories of Dr. Spondis? We have already addressed the issue of increment. How many people have ever been convicted? Okay. It's the way the politics plays in cabinet. So okay. now why are they asking for the <laughs> statement? <laughs> Follow mainstream conversations on current affairs and leading policy debates in Uganda. It is in our interest to handle arrested people very nicely. Right here on The Big Debate. Let me, let me find no, a place. I, I was quiet. I was, I, no, I was quiet. It's a hard-hitting talk show on development issues in the political and social economic arena. Discussions that inform policy and trigger high-level dialogue. Now showing on CTV. Don't blink. Now showing on CTV. Start your day fresh with TV unlike anything you've seen before. Wake up with Sunrise at Sea for your daily dose of freshly cut stories, trending online discussions, self-care and constructive conversations. No topic is off limits. Watch Sunrise at Sea every weekday at 7 a.m. Now showing on CTV. Don't blink. Welcome back from that short break. Well, welcome back from that short break, and thank you for staying with us. You're watching CTV, Month of the Woman, and uh, even during the break, we continued talking because the conversation uh, is quite interesting. We're talking about the rights of Ugandan workers, both here in the country and also abroad, and how it's important to know what the law says uh, before you take on any work, both here and abroad, uh, so that in case anything happens, you're able to be protected. Uh, the reason why we're having this conversation is that we are seeing increasingly uh, more people aspiring to take on work um, elsewhere, but also, uh, especially in the last five years, we've seen lots of stories in the media about Ugandans who've been tortured uh, until you know they've lost maybe body parts. Some of them have lost their lives and come back um, in coffins. And uh, we have uh, a legal officer for Platform for Labor Action who is explaining to us what the law says. And we also have the Deputy National Coordinator for preventing uh, of traffic for prevention of trafficking uh, in persons, Agnes Igoy, and they're sharing their knowledge and expertise with us on that, on what uh, you should know. Uh, before we went uh, on a break, you're engaged in a very passionate conversation mm -hmm. and you're telling us uh, some of the things, okay, adding on to what ought to be known. Mm. Um, and, and even, I think you had started highlighting a point on um, how even when the labor ex external labor organizations mess up, we also have incidences uh, of individuals mm -hmm. uh, who do wrong, or some of them even feel like they know where they've worked so mm -hmm. well that mm -hmm. they want to go on their own, which now mm -hmm. exposes that individual to mm -hmm. being trafficked in case anything happens. My mm -hmm. question is, if mm -hmm. I have spotted a, an opportunity somewhere and I know mm -hmm. someone, mm -hmm. don't I have the liberty to mm -hmm. go on my own? to work in that place and work with that person? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Because in this country, because right now we are talking about labor externalization, that's why we see that uh, many times you concentrate it is women and what. There are many people who have gone, to, left this country to go and work abroad and properly. You've seen some have worked with even United Nations, some with what. But the thing is, you know, go to Minister of Gender because there are those who leave because you've got this contract and all that, yeah, Minister of Gender is there, even to help you verify, you know, some of, some, some of these responsibilities. There's government to government. Then there's through recruitment. The only challenge we, why we concentrate more about domestic workers and what, because that's where the biggest chunk of exploitation is. Right. And do you know why it is, it is the biggest? Because these, these ones live with their employers. Me and you, we go, get out of the home to go and work. Even if things uh, weren't disturbing at home, you, you go home and you Back are alone. To your own home. But domestic worker, your house girl, whom you call house girl, lives with you. So you leave her at home. Sometimes maybe if you want to lock her up, you leave her with your children here in Uganda. But she eats the different food. 
Now, now, how sure are you that your child is being fed and she's not eating your child's food when you are away? You know? So, so the same challenges, you see, because you live with your employer. You cannot tag a policeman to everyone to go to somebody's home. You see where that challenge is. That's why you have to really constantly, that, that's why you find that when, when the Minister of Gender, even the ministers and all that, they are creating that committee whereby, you know, the people here work with the, their counterparts, you know, so that way as those issues come up, you know, you, 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 you reinforce. That's why you find that they have to increasingly, you know, revise bilateral agreements to say, okay, can we, can these domestic workers have a right to the telephone? But they've also complained that some people go and forget to work and they spend time on social media. Or not. We have also had those uh, complaints from workers. <laughs> Just like how you have complaints with your domestic worker that they're on TV the whole day, you go back, they've not done the work you've done. The same challenges they have are the same challenges you have with your domestic worker here. So that's where the what? Biggest challenge you know, in. is in there. Yes. You mentioned something uh, which mm. reminded me. Uh, mm. Tamale's organization, mm. uh, I think they did a call to action a few years back mm. where they wanted uh, a separation mm. so that we don't have all the people who are doing domestic work mm. staying in with mm. their employers mm. um, every, every, every now and then. He can tell us more. Mm. about that and why they, they are advocating mm -hmm. uh, for one awareness on that but also a call to action so that uh, homeowners mm. do not necessarily have to stay with their domestic workers mm. um, in their houses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now on, on the point of that, eh, the, the reason being is the reason being one because the main reason is, is that see, if the domestic worker is coming from outside, you know, that, that types of domestic workers, yeah. there's a living domestic worker that she mentioned who stays with you, then there's a liberal domestic worker who's coming from outside. For the person is coming from outside, it's like any normal employment. Mm. But they come from outside, they know they're supposed to do A, B, mm. C, and D. But from this time to this time. This time, the tasks are specified, say, they're coming in from mm. 8, mm. Also, I live at work at, I live to work, go to work at 7. So they're coming in at 7, and they're leaving at 3. So in that period of time, they're going to be doing laundry, cooking, and all that. When the time runs, you do what? You so unless the person comes when they know they are specified timetable, you know, mm. I'm going, I'm doing A, B, C, and D. But if so that also that helps to avoid what we call wrong because now the person is staying mm. in that place, there is no what we call time limit on working hours. You can find that the person can be overworked until even at one a.m. Mm. One a.m. the boss is calling you, go on, go on, get a juice at one a.m. You understand? So there is not really that type of person to rest to find the productivity is going over you're working until like one then you have to start at 5 30 you wake up the kids you help bathe the kids and all that so you're basically working 24 7. now if the person is living outside it helps to avoid those drumming but then the main issue is that because most of the domestic workers are women they suffer a lot of what domestic violence that they have not done this they have not done this so most of the employers they resort to what to, to, to harassing them to, mm. to like to violence or as, as a form sort of punishment and how much of the domestic workers are also young people they're not really like very I find the domestic worker who's above like 30 they're normally young girls between 18 to like and, 24 and, uh, 18 to 25 I think is old now that's why I also now take the question back to her mm -hmm. I do not know um, if you're aware or if you've noticed the trend that in most of the homes mm -hmm. and even for uh, well educated highly placed um, families I would mm -hmm. say both men and women we have maids we tend to have maids who are young mm. uh, of underage mm. so if you're uh, dealing in um, ending child labor mm. um, have you looked into that mm. yes we have mm. and, and people have been, been penalized for that you know but now you, you know the challenges they are in like we said they are in t inside your what home that's why we, we're even uh, um, you know telling people I, I keep talking all the time you know that even uh, in, when we, we train a lot of uh, community liaison officers who work even in, in the communities. Now what uh, my counterpart is saying about living out of the home, yeah, there are people who have that, by the way, right now, that they don't, because even them, they say, ah, well, I, mean, I get challenges when, they, when even they are living in my home. Mm, you know, the, the issues privacy, of privacy, yes. Yeah, the mm. issues and all that, they are there. Mm. But the challenge we have is that who are we employing in our homes? 
they are people mainly from rural areas. Right. So when you do that, you know, they will say that now you're, you're taking away employment, you know, you know, from them. Because they also now have, where do they stay? Exactly. As they come to your home. You, you see how it is. So in most cases, you're going to reduce their pay because they have to. Uh, if, if you can't uh, tell the employer to pay for their accommodation elsewhere. That means you're getting rid of that. And in a country where there's no, uh, what, the living wage, you know, the, 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 the work, because the domestic workers are paid differently, you know, in, dif in different homes. Some people don't pay them at all. Some people, there are many instances, you go to your village, how many people will, will come to you that, ah, oh, you just take, you take, take my child, let her be helping you. And that's child labor. Yes. I mean, a lot of them are volunteering. Yes, we know but, that but it happens homes. in our country. You, yes. go, you go to your village, people are, are flocking to you, giving you their children you know, for free, just nyamba, you know? So, so that parenting, hmm? some parents, their children are missing, they have never looked for them. There's even no, no police report. You wonder. Eh? You wonder. A child is missing. A child is looking for, for their parents, but no parents are not looking for the children. You see where the problem is? That really the family unit, how do we, how do we go there? Yes. So the domestic workers, yes, that, that would be the perfect arrangement. Because I wish they had somewhere to stay then come. But you know now the, it will be the accommodation. Because there are people who are employing that. It also means that there are how, much, how much are people earning? Even the normal wages for people who are employing domestic workers. You know, how much are they earning? They will not be able, you know, to earn that. That means now women, some women will leave work now to go home because they have children, to, to take care of children. Right. So there are so many dynamics. So, I, so I, I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, you're doing research in these areas. So, so then the more we continue doing research, the more we continue you know, to inform policy, it helps, you know, all of us in right. the process. Yes. yes still going back to, especially mm. the, the, the children who are doing casual work, yeah. taking care of children. I mean, mm. we saw um, kids who may be as young as 11 uh, mm. being babysitters. Mm. And uh, I would say that now that also informs how we develop as a country because mm. if this child is earning mm. very little money, mm. they've not got a lot of education mm. Mm. and maybe they'll get pregnant at some point and they'll mm. give birth and then even their child is not empowered and they'll end up mm. maybe also doing, you know, the same mm. work. Um, can we see sensitization campaigns or maybe being done where even homeowners, for example, mm. uh, could help mm. and say, I'll set time for this child because they're underage mm. and then they go to school. Mm. Is that something that you have thought about in your uh, directorate? Yes, yeah, sensitization will go, uh, sensitization, they, they can never be enough. Yeah. But I also want to shock you that COVID-19 showed us that uh, even our family is a dangerous place for our children. It is that shocking. The majority of the girls got pregnant during lockdown at their homes. So home is not a safe place for our children. Now we don't know what to do. Because you, the parent, you, you saw the amount, how many were getting pregnant. So like, and now it's going to get uh, worse before it gets better. Do right. you know why? Because when a child is producing a child, how is the child going to take <coughs> care of this child? And, and they've they not go, they are no longer in possible. school yeah. you know mm -hmm. they, you know some of them you know want to go to school now children taking care of children and then home is not safe so so like you said all of us have a stake now you don't only have to look at your child you don't because if you if you're really if we care about children of this country let's not only concentrate on our children it's ours all of us like your community, your neighbor's child and all that. That's the only way we are going to help this. Because there are some parents who are not fit to be parents. There are some parents no, where their children... That's a very, a very yes, harsh statement. It is harsh. Because we've seen how there are children who can't even go back home and they are safe in their homes. Right. Because tell me, if your father impregnates you, you're a child. And there's a lot of grooming, secrecy. And those are girls who get pregnant. What about the boys? Who will never tell you? Because there's no evidence yes. to show. And like so, girls, like I yeah. said, like we do those things, like you know, you're preventing, of course, awareness, taking the you know children to school, uh, making sure that they're actually going to school and they're at school. Okay, then you have to prosecute, you know, people who are who who are doing these things. 
Mm? And also supporting, because when you're talking about, uh, you know, even awareness, you know, as you prosecute, because you see even like, you know, pregnancy and what, who are these people who are making what? How are we bring up this boy child to respect women, to respect a fellow girl? It is also common when the girl is going out and what, what they say, hey, be careful, be careful, but the boys, ah, boys will be boys. You've heard that. Right. Men will always be men. Really, eh? Boys, then it, it doesn't, then a boy has made a girl pregnant somewhere, then you're like, oh, muzukulu. Mm. You know, that it is proof that, what is that? Uh, mm. Now to mm. bring it back to uh, Badru, you are still telling us about uh, that call to action that you're making uh, so that uh, we have the separation of household or the workplace and uh, where the person is staying. And that's ex especially for domestic workers. Uh, what would you want to achieve? Because she has highlighted a very important point, which I'd also wanted to make, on the economic burden that happens. Because most of the people are doing external work, uh, like she highlighted, will be coming, say, from the villages. And the places they are working in are just too expensive for them. And they might be maybe forced to stay in slums, which now also breeds um, other challenges for these young people who are mostly girls. Yeah, so how are you considering that um, in the, the, in the advocacy yeah, that, you, that you're calling for? Yes, now in, in the gap to that advocacy, we are, we are working with an organization called DOA, Domestic Workers Association, mm. where we, we engage with, with the leaders of the domestic workers. So they tell us the issues that they have and we do it. And we provide advice. We're saying, we're saying like about this is that it doesn't have to like start now where by at this, at this moment in time, all the domestic workers don't stay in with the, with the workers. Because the realities of Uganda that she, she, my colleague has explained are known, so it's, it's difficult. Most of the domestic workers are, are, are brought from the what? From the rural areas to come and, to come and work. Right. But you can find the other domestic workers who have been able to work, mm -hmm. and, and what we imply is that if you're able to work and save something, you can do it, find where to stay, where you're accommodated, where you can accommodate yourself, and then where well, you can look for jobs some because you see if you're 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 a liberal domestic worker, you're able to afford to be for jobs. You're able to you can, able, you can be able to do two or three jobs. Unlike if you're living in, if you're living in you're doing one job and that And you're expected to be there all the time. All the time. Yeah. If you're living out, you can do three jobs, two or three increases what? The levels of income and all that which can be better level of your family. Um, that brings me back to our respect for, you know, the laws and the things that we write. Mm -hmm. Because even in corporate places, they might tell you, we expect you nine to five. Mm -hmm. But somehow, they are able to keep you or they expect you or they call you to come into work at seven, mm -hmm. and etc. So for this mm -hmm. domestic worker, surely, <laughs> um, how will the respect of the law be? Like, yeah, like I said before, you yeah. see, if if we live, you are living, you live a domestic worker. You have some bit of freedom. I don't know if you're getting my point. Yes, yes. The employer is not really controlling you. Most of the domestic workers, they put in a gate in, in someone's they lock home. You, in. you don't leave. You stay inside 24/7. Mm -hmm. You don't go anywhere. Maybe you're, maybe if you are a Muslim, you're in a Catholic Catholic family, they don't even allow you to go to pray on Friday to the mosque. Right. And all that. But if you're living outside, remember it's like when you're living outside, the person is going to pay you. Which day you come, you can tell the person to them unable to come, mm. and they, they will not start throwing things at you. Or what that kind of thing? Because <laughs> you are not there. Yeah. So, but I'll come in tomorrow. So tomorrow they'll call them, and you'll do it. Mm. You'll come because if you're able to stay outside, you have more freedom to choose. You understand? Mm. Right. Yes. So have you have your help. research findings? Oh, you wanted to say uh, something? Yes. yes. I also want to really speak for people who treat their domestic workers well. They are also there. Right. You've seen people, they bring a domestic worker, okay? The, the issue was for them to do domestic work, and I've seen them even send them to school. Or when they have homeschooling, she studies with her children. We've seen them helping them, you know, with their finances and all that. Then after that, okay, because, uh, which is a good practice. So we also need to share good practices. You come with this domestic worker. Okay, you're going to work. What do you want to use your money for? Some of them, I want to go back to school. Some of them, it is a business. You'll find that you're helping this girl, you know, many times it's a girl. Yeah. You know, again, extra skills True. besides, some people leave their domestic workers and even teach them computer. They even buy it, they even teach so that by the time the person leaves your home, that should be the, really the ideal, you know? It's not the majority, but I'm saying like, let people also learn, because you can also study 
You know, you can also study on how to treat your domestic worker. You can even send your domestic worker to school to become a better domestic person. worker. Indeed. Yes, teach, and, teach them and how that's to part cook. Of creating them, a sustainable yes, world. Sustainable. Like we're We've seen about. people even go, the, the best example, the ones who return, you remember the one who returned with her, her employers even sponsored her wedding. I remember mm. the get car went. They are best practices like that. There are good people in this world who are treating people well. But we can learn, you know, those best practices. But we are also saying that should be the basics, really. You know, you really to have a domestic worker and you have you eat different food than they eat. Me, that is shocking. Even educated people in this <laughs> in this country, that you eat different food, even your domestic worker eats what? Different, different food. food. You you really want but she's the one cooking it. Me, I finish it in the kitchen. <laughs> All right. If yeah. you feel a domestic worker, <laughs> yeah. If I'm a domestic worker, I eat it in the kitchen. Oh, then well. I come and tell you the chicken came without uh, the, 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 the the thigh. <laughs> okay, that might put you in in, in line mm. for yeah. some trouble. Um, I wanted to to ask Tamale, uh, the research you've done. Have you found? Uh, do you have findings on the rates of uh, maybe abuse? Um, physical abuse, uh, but also sexual abuse, have you been able to establish that so that we know how prevalent uh, the, the situation might be in the country? In the research we have done, we have found instances of, like, like, all, like all, all that you say, uh, physical violence, sexual abuse, and all that. Even when you speak to the domestic workers, to the association door, they'll tell that they'll tell that they, they can bring to us, they will partner with them that in case one of you, your colleagues, is in legal trouble. We can do what? Send them to the organization and then we help with the case where maybe they have been sexually assaulted. We can help follow up with the case where with the police as well as ensure that the file is what? Goes to the courts. But if we're talking about concrete numbers that it's difficult to know. Because you see like you said before, reporting in Uganda is, is difficult. Most people don't believe in the systems. They'll be like, ah, it's going to court, it's going to waste our time and all that. So they have first up to see that if you follow up on a case successfully, then Paul, most people start to do it, start to come out and say, this is happening to me, and all that. And so that's what you're realizing in, in the work you're that you're doing. Yes, yeah. If you follow up on a few cases and then you, you just success for speak to them, then it also helps. But most of the issues, issues are sent to us are domestic workers who have worked and they have not been paid. Because mm -hmm. when, a person, when, you, when the person is living in the house, they will think that I'm giving you accommodation, I'm giving you food, and I'm watching TV, comfortable mm, buying you, the, the, you the other exactly. surgeries so, as well yeah those are most of the issues we get is non-payment because the person has worked they're not being paid mm. and then when when they're being when they're when they're being like dismissed all of that job they also don't repatriate them because you see when the law says when you bring someone from when you bring someone from a distance of more than 100 kilometers to come and work for you you have to do what you have to repatriate or transport them back but you find in most instances, most of them are dismissed from work without payment on that repatriation. Those are the most instances they get in a civil matter. Then in regards to a criminal matter, like we talk about the unwanted advances from some of their employers on sexual and sexual assaults. Right. Um, and from uh, the association, uh, do you find that um, the workers that you have right now, are they aware of their rights? So are they bringing them up or it's just that um, the lack of belief in systems like you mentioned? Now, from the association, is that we we ran a project for two years. It was about domestic workers, and and the association was the product of, of that project. So all the members of the association would sensitize them. We used to go to the communities, and we were sensitizing them about their rights of domestic workers and all that. How were you able to access the domestic workers? Because you hinted on something mm -hmm. where someone will be put in a gate, and they exactly. don't allow you to speak to yeah. anyone or anywhere. So that's why we were able to access them through these other living, other, the ones who are living at domestic workers could maybe meet in a safe place. They call this one that, they could call each other and say, COVID no, Ajay, COVID no, Ajay, no. Like that, you know, in that period of time, there is that time that the domestic worker will get. Yeah. Then it's like, no, so they would come. Because remember that most of these employers, they come back like at five, seven, they get so around the time, most of, most of the trainings were done between, between midday and three o'clock. It was a set time they could be able to do it. To go back. So through those trainings, we were able to do it to sensitize them about their rights as workers and all that. So we were advising that we cannot reach every person. But since we have reached you, mm. you do what? Call so and so. Call. So we advise them to do what? Make an association. Now the people in the association, 
as long as we are continuing the what? The, the work. dating mm. of, of, of fellow domestic workers and even fellow members who do what? Who sign up and join the ones who are what? Mm. Who are teaching them. So first we were not able to do what? To do that work. We were not able to reach out to everyone, but reach out to a number of people who, who, who told in the form of like spread the gospel, like tell other people that this what happened and what. And that's mostly in Kampala? It's mainly in Kampala Metropolitan. And, yeah. and then when I say Metropolitan, I mean Wakiso Mukono. And then even the eastern regions. Right. And and how many domestic workers have joined this association so far? Association now, because now that from there I'm not a member of the association. I'm unable to disclose, but I think it's quite a number because every day they keep on sending us cases <laughs> and new people can always join. Because I could tell you a number today mm. when I don't know like last week a bus came and joined. You understand yeah. like yeah. that? It, it, it could be a, a rough estimate. Um, earlier on, uh, you had mentioned to us that uh, through your work, you've discovered some very, um, I would say, shocking things about the treatment of casual laborers. Uh, because I would say, maybe for a number of people, when you talk about casual laborers, we may only think, um, we, we do not look at the extent to which we have many other people working in, in places like factories. Um, if you can share with our viewers uh, some of those things, and this is, of course, a call to action as well, uh, for improvement whether you're an employer or you're someone or you know someone uh, who is working um, in, in, in such a place and they may go, be going through the same. Yes, now for that what we have mainly encountered with these casual workers and, and laborers is that the main issue we have been encountering it's now a recurring theme is the issue to do with accidents, suffered injuries, suffered while at work. B which lead to? So those injuries can lead to permanent disability. For example, I'll give you an example of loaders, coffee loaders, we know I get issues with them, with the coffee factories. So most of them really suffer terrible back injuries mm -hmm. or guys on, guys on the construction site. They normally suffer terrible injuries. Some of them even die, even die, die in the workplace. But you find that most of the people, when they suffer these injuries, they don't know where to report and what to do. Because they, they think that the employer offer them treatment, they're doing them a favor. But then it should be the right of the employer to treat someone if they suffer an injury in the course of what of their employment. That means I'm at work, I'm a loader, I'm loading, let's say I'm loading sacks of, sacks of coffee on my back, and then what something happens whereby the whole, the whole stash falls into me, then I suffer injuries, and all that, so I'm supposed to be what? Treated by the, mm. by the, by the employer. By the employer. Right. I'm also supposed to be given equipment which will prevent, which will help me in case of an accident, prevent the damage, I suffer an injury. But you find most people don't follow the occupational safety and health laws, whereby they're supposed to give people helmets, protection jackets, and all that. They don't, then people suffer injuries. Now, when they suffer the injuries, the employer they will just take them to a hospital. And leave them there. hospital and leave yeah. them there. Yeah. Yet, first, supposed to be the one person suffered the injury, mm -hmm. you contact the nearest labor officer and tell the labor officer that the doctor worker suffered an injury. This is, a, this, is a, this is the doctor's report saying, then there is no permanent, they can still be treated, then you treat them. When the treatment is done and no injury is permanent, then you do what? There's a formula that's in the law to compensate that person for the injury they have suffered. And then they can continue working with you, but you can give them what, what we call life work. The person was a loader before, then they suffered back injuries, at least now you give them something like to maybe be messenger in the workplace like that, life work. So that's, that's the main issue of the that people, when they suffer accidents at work, they don't know where to go, and they, they, they know where to report, and then the employers as well, they don't do what? They don't really treat, treat the workers as they should be, should be doing. And then, they don't, and then if, when they don't treat, they also don't compensate. They don't compensate because most times the money can be a lot, and then they have not insured. The worker that, or even yes, the company. As the law says. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time, uh, but this has been a conversation on ensuring the rights um, of workers uh, who are doing domestic work and also casual labor, both here in Uganda and externally. And like you have heard, the tips are mainly if you're going anywhere, make sure that you have the right documentation, go through the right processes um, so that you r minimize any chances or you reduce chances of if anything happens to you and if that happens to you, you have the right channels uh, to report to like you have heard. Well, that's been it uh, for CTV Month of the Woman today. Uh, more conversations are lined up for you and more programming is also coming up with Brunch Request at the top of the hour. We'll also have PM Edition at 9 p.m. and Enjube Golobe at 7 p.m. Don't blink. <laughs>